Well, let us pray. Almighty God, grant us your spirit that we might rightly understand and truly obey your word of truth. Open our hearts that we may love what you command and desire what you promise. Set us free from private distractions that we may hear and from selfish pride that we may receive the promise of your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. What do you make of Jesus Christ? What do you think of Jesus Christ? This is the, the question that we're going to be asking today. Well, the whole gospel up to this point has been about Jesus, who he is as one sent from God and how people respond to him. What do you make of Jesus Christ? Well, we're going to be looking at Pilate's response today. We're going to be looking at John chapter 18. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. We're going to be looking at verses 28 to 40. It is on the screen, but I also invite you to turn in your physical Bibles. John 18, starting at verse 28. Well, then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to ask them, What charges are you bringing against this man? If you were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. And this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Well, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to, do, to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. You want me to release the king of the Jews. They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is truth? The words that Pilate asks. What is truth? Now to understand this, um, ask a question. Who here has a smartphone? Who here has a smartphone? Okay, a couple people do. Now imagine that your smartphone breaks. One day you wake up and it doesn't turn on. You touch the but you touch the screen, you try to turn on the buttons and it doesn't come to life. Now you have a couple options. You can um, take your phone to the tech store down the road, the local the local guys and gals that'll fix that kind of stuff. You can maybe take it to Best Buy. If you're really bold, you can try to fix it yourself, looking up something on the internet. But if you want a high probability that this is going to be fixed, where are you going to take it? You are going to take it to the source. You're going to go back to the manufacturer. You're going to go back to Apple if you have an iPhone. If you operate off of Android, you're going to take it to the Microsoft store. They're the ones that made it. And so they know the most about it. They're the ones that are going to fix it. What is truth? Well, we're going to define truth as God's reality. 
There is no higher authority than the creator himself. If we want to talk about the meaning of our existence, about the things that happen here with us, with us people, and everything that's been created, the best place to go is back to the source, the one who made it all. There is no higher authority than the God who created the heavens and the earth. Truth is God's reality. Now in the Gospel of John, truth is not some proposition. It is not some hazy concept. It's not some nebulous idea or speculation. No, truth is a person. Truth has flesh. Truth has skin and bones. Truth is Jesus Christ. Just a couple chapters before this one, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus' disciples says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for you. Well, then we will believe. What does Jesus say? He says, Philip, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Philip says, show us God and we'll be, we'll be content. Jesus says, whenever you look at me, you are looking at God. Jesus Christ reveals God. Jesus Christ is the truth, as John tells us. Now when we put ourselves into the middle of this passage that we're in today, we see that Jesus is standing trial before Pilate. The Jews have brought Jesus in to the Roman governor because Jesus has made some uh, what they think are blasphemous claims. He has um, claimed that God is his father and he has claimed that he has been sent from God. So for this, the Jews say, well, this man deserves to be executed. Oh, we know what they think of Jesus. Well, not much. He deserves to die. That's reading it on a surface level. But if we look at it a little bit deeper, if we look where John is actually going with this passage, we see that it's not Jesus on trial before Pilate, but it's switched. It's Pilate who is on trial before Jesus. The truth is standing there right in front of Pilate. And what John is asking is Pilate. What do you make of this man? What do you think about Jesus? Now Jesus in this passage says, For this reason I have come to this world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth, everyone who belongs to the truth, listens to me. Now D.A. Carson, he's a respected New Testament scholar, he says that with these words, Jesus is implicitly extending an invitation to Pilate. He's saying, Pilate, see me for who I am. Pilate, I have come here to testify to the truth. I am that truth. Listen to me and follow me. Well, Jesus has already said who he is. He said that he is a king, but his kingdom is not the kingdom that's from this world. No, his kingdom is from elsewhere, and he has come to testify to that kingdom. He has come to testify to that truth. Now, Pilate being the man who he is in charge of this, um, this Roman area that's uh, living with, he's living amongst the Jews, he knows about Jesus. Surely he has heard about him. And the way that John has set this up, saying that Jesus is the truth, well, it gives us a different perspective now as we look at this question that's asked by Pilate. What is truth? With these words, Pilate is rejecting Jesus as Jesus has presented himself as the truth. Pilate is rejecting Jesus, and Pilate is rejecting the truth. Now, in our world today, we live in a society that rejects truth. Now, if you, if you, 
want to have a belief, if you want to have a personal belief, well, that's okay. That can be true to you. But don't you dare say that that truth is ultimate, that that truth has authority. Well, in uh, 2016, Oxford Dictionary came out with their word of the year. You know how they do this at the beginning of the year um, to kind of um, summarize what has happened in the past. Well, do you know what their word of the year was in 2016? Post-truth. Post-truth. They said that this is our current reality, that truth is dead. We no longer give value to the objective facts. No, instead, we place a higher priority on our emotions and on our personal convictions. Objective facts don't really have much bearing on the way things are going. And we see this post-truth era being lived out in many spheres of life. Well, back in 2013, um, a woman named Belle Gibson, not Mel, but Belle. Have you heard of Belle Gibson? Well, Belle Gibson was a 23-year-old um, attractive woman who had terminal cancer. She had terminal cancer, but uh, she tried this alternative path to healing. So she started um, eating only certain foods, and she tried um, uh, going through these alternative therapies. And it turns out that her terminal cancer was miraculously being healed. And so people really picked up on this. Hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram. She appeared in TV shows and on magazines. She even um, started her own wellness app. People were just eating this up. Well, if she can do it, why can't we? Well, it came out a couple years after all this happened that this story wasn't true. Not that her cancer wasn't healing, but that she never had cancer to begin with. The whole thing was a lie. Now, I don't know what's more striking, the fact that she would lie so boldly or the fact that people believed it for so long. They wanted to believe it, and so they shared it all over the social media, not, not checking the facts, not checking the facts what she was saying about this cancer, not checking the facts that she was saying about the doctors. No, people wanted to believe that this was true, and so they embraced it. They accepted it, even though the probability of something like this happening is very slim. This goes against the objective facts. We also see this era of post-truth being played out in our political world. Who here has um, heard of this thing, uh, fake news? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, people have heard of it. Fake news. Yeah, it, it's no longer um, false information that people are putting out. No, uh, fake news now is if something undermines your viewpoint or if you do not like something, if it's unfavorable to you, then you will say something against it. Even if it goes against the objective facts. Now the Washington Post, um, they put out these, these statistics that uh, President Trump He's often associated with this idea of fake news. But from the time that he entered office uh, until 2018, um, that he, um, they identified over 3,000, over 3,000 false or misleading claims that he made. They averaged that out to somewhere around like six a day. Now this man was, was putting forward um, fake news or he was putting forward lies. But he's still in office. In fact, many people still support him. Because it's not based on objective truth anymore. It's based on what you believe personally. If emotionally you feel like it's okay, well then, it's okay. It can be your truth. Even if it goes against, even if it doesn't consider the objective facts. Is this something new, though? Well, no. We go all the way back to the story 
of the fall where Adam and Eve are in the garden and there's a snake in the garden. What does the snake say? Did God really say that? It sounds like fake news to me. Well, Adam and Eve had before them this relationship. They were in the presence of the divine reality, the presence of truth. But then the serpent comes along and he questions God's truth. He questions the objective facts that Adam and Eve have been given. And what do Adam and Eve do? Well, they, they saw that the fruit was good for food. They saw that it was pleasing for the eye. And they saw that it was desirable for attaining wisdom. They thought, they believed, hey, this looks good. I'm just going to ignore what God said. The author and maker of all truth. I'm going to exchange this truth for the deception of something better. And so they give this perfect relationship away in exchange for this lie. And so ever since then, we have been lost. We have been searching for the truth. We have been searching for meaning, and we are unable to find it. The majority of the problem is that we are looking inside of ourselves for truth. We are trying to manufacture truth on our own. But some truth is not something that we can just produce. No, truth has to come to us from the outside. We are a broken people. We are a people who have been stained by sin. We are corrupted by this original sin, our relationship with the truth. Our relationship with the God and creator of the universe has been broken. And so this truth does not come from in us. It has to come from the outside. And that's what happens. This truth comes to us as a gift. And it comes to us in the form of Jesus Christ. The word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. So the question becomes, what do you make of the truth? Well, even though we are thousands of years removed from this conversation between Pilate and Jesus, the truth is still the same. The point of the story remains the same, that Jesus Christ is the truth. And now we are pointedly asked this same question, what do you do with Jesus? What do you make of him? Is he telling the truth? This man comes to us making some pretty bold claims. He's saying that he is the one who is sent from God. He's saying that God is his father. Him and the father are one. He is the lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. This is what Jesus is saying about him. So are we... Like Pilate, do we reject it? Pilate has the truth standing right in front of him. This Jesus who was just struck by one of the high priest's officials. So Jesus is standing there probably with this red mark on his face or this maybe a black eye and it's swollen. He's standing there by himself. All of his followers have deserted him. He's probably in some ragtag clothes. Pilate looks at him and says, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you my king? Am I subject to you? What does Pilate think about Jesus? Well, not much. Not much. So the question comes back to us. What do we think about Jesus? Do we accept him at his word? Well, if you have accepted Jesus at his word, obedience follows. Belief is, no, belief is never, never separate from obedience and living it out and listening. Jesus says, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. They follow me. So I want to challenge you. Those who have accepted Christ into their lives, I want to challenge you to listen to him. 
I want to challenge you to take a small step of obedience. Now, I don't know where God is calling you to follow, where he is calling you to be obedient, but I'm sure that you do. I'm sure that he has been stirring somewhere in your heart and somewhere in your life. And maybe the Lord is calling you to spend more time with him. Maybe this is your step of obedience, a small step. Maybe he's calling you to let go of something, to let go of the fear that you have over this illness or over this life situation that you're in or over the illness of a family member or friend, to let go of the fear. Maybe he's calling you to let go of and surrender this anger or this resentment that you've been holding on to. Maybe he is calling you to uh, take a step toward mending a broken relationship. What is the Lord, the giver of life, the author of truth, what is he calling you to do? As you listen to his voice, where are you walking to follow him? Just small steps. I'm not asking for anything big. Take a small step in the way of obedience. And for those who are unsure of Jesus, when you say, oh, what do you think about Jesus? Your response is, I don't know. I don't know. Or maybe you've already rejected Jesus. I want you to open yourselves up to his love. Well, Jesus Christ came to us. First, he was in heaven with God. Perfect relationship. He gave up that glory to come down to us. These broken people who were his enemies. We set ourselves against him. And so now, Jesus Christ has come to us, and he has come to die for our sins, to die for the reason that we have separated ourselves from him. He has died for you, and he has died for me. So I invite you to know his love. Take a small step of obedience in welcoming that love, being open to having that conversation, because in Jesus Christ rest all grace all truth, all fullness of life, and all meaning. Amen.